Let's take a peek at where we're at in our phylogenetic tree. We've knocked off Dondarians and Tenophores. Now we're probably going to explore this group of phyla. Pideomenthes we're going to talk about. Nemertines we're going to skip. Yes. Eh, it's another worm. Uh, and then we'll move into Mollusk uh, next, uh, in the next lecture. So Platyalmenthes, boom! Where we at? Platyalmenthes. Uh, and so now we're moving on, and we have our first triploblast. Yay! It's got a mesoderm. All right. No coelom though. Right? No coelom. No coelom. I mean, it doesn't have a body cavity. Uh, so they're very flat organisms. Uh, it's also a blind gut, which means it does not go all the way through, which means one hole from mouth and anus. Uh, but it does have the three types of tissues. And so these are pretty simple organisms. Uh, very simple bilateral symmetry. Also our first bilateral symmetrical group. Uh, so very, very simple in that regard. And you can look at the picture and see, like, they, they do show bilateral symmetry. Uh, there's a few classes of them, very different behaviors and lifestyles. We have parasites, we have tapeworms, which are also parasites, uh, and then we have uh, the free living ones. Uh, the free living ones. Uh, so all kinds of crazy groups in here. So we're going to explore these, see what kind of makes them different, uh, unique, different, etc. Uh, so yeah, turbularians, the free living ones, the fun ones, the cute ones, the trematodes and monogeneans, which are parasitic in nature, and then cestodes, which are also parasitic because they're tapeworms. You can see the tapeworm on the bottom right. All right, so general traits of these. A lot of species. It's, a, it's an impressive number of species, like 20K. But when you're a parasite, you'll have a lot of species because they'll be very specialized sometimes for like one specific species. So they're like, oh, this is for this one species of bird. This is this one species of mammal. And so they'll specialize in those different uh, hosts and they'll lead to different adaptations. So you'll get new species from that. So it's pretty common to see high numbers of uh, species of this for parasites. Uh, they live in a wide variety of habitats. Uh, so on land, uh, usually in, it needs water. They need water to survive. At least an aquatic type habitat. Uh, so they need some moisture. Uh, but marine freshwater, all that. Bilateral symmetry. They have a head region, so where the, the kind of the stalk things are coming out, that's the head region. Then they have a tail end at the back. Uh, they can be live on their own, so live outside, hunt, eat, whatever they want to do, or they can be parasitic and then set up a host or take advantage of a, another organism uh, in that, that type of way. So parasitize them. Um, and so one of the things that limits them body size wise is how they get their gas exchange. And so uh, in us, we have our own complicated, you know, respiratory system, but for them, they use simple diffusion. Now, this works for them, but it means they can't get super thick. So they have to be very, very flat. So this way, the, the gas exchange can actually take place and go inside all of their cells. Otherwise, they're too thick. The innermost cells, we get nothing, and they'll just die. So you can't have that. Uh, so instead of having it this way, they're very simple, very flat. All cells get the oxygen and can get rid of any sort of or whatever they need to, to survive. So whatever gas exchange needs to happen, they can do it. And also you get a waste this way. So their size is very much a limiting factor because of their diffusion principle they have. That's a very unique part of this group uh, that stands out. Uh, they don't really have a true anus. So the mouth, that one opening of that blind gut serves as both. So they'll, they'll eat and poop in the same hole. Uh, so not bad, and they can reproduce asexually and asexually, or sexually and asexually. So uh, not not as bad. Uh, some of these can be parasitic in this. Video. Sorry, I I moved ahead on a different slide, not this one. So if you're just catching up, I was I talked about to here. Um, so yeah, they got this going on. So they'd be in that area, and they have mesenchyme. So that's in between the skin and the gut, and this is the thing that can become different types of tissues. So it's. They have stem cells there that allows them to regenerate very well, and so that's one of the key traits of pyomenthes is you can cut these things all to pieces, and they'll still grow back for the most part, because uh, they have that t that cell, uh, that type of tissue that allows them to do so. It's an embryonic type tissue, uh, and it's also used for asexual reproduction as well. Uh, yeah, they're pretty cool little organisms. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, so let's um, let's look at these groups of pyomenthes. Uh, what they got. Going so the turbolarans, the first group, Pideomenthes, uh, within here. And so these are the more common, which you normally think of as being like, oh, the common flatworm. Uh, they're very cute. They're these cute little eye spots. If you see them, they have like little, little eyes. They can't see that well, but they can pick up on light. And they usually like to live in like dark spots. 
Um, so they're cool. They also have the gastrovascular cavity with little feed, and they have a, a, a pharynx and a mouth. And so sometimes you can see like the proboscis coming out and moving and just like sucking in food. It's pretty cool. Uh, there's some some good videos out there. There there may be one included in this. I don't remember if I ever used one, but so don't be looked at it in lab. Uh, but yeah, I'd check one out. It's pretty sweet. Uh, just saying. But you can also see some other tissues that pop up. What have they got going on? It's got muscle that can move. It's like a squeeching noise going on somewhere. Uh, okay, so within this turbulence group, a lot of species, um, generally free living, so they don't really parasitize anybody, so they're a lot of fun. They're very small. Uh, they can get kind of bigger. You can see them with the naked eye, no problem. Uh, we used to do an experiment uh, where we would uh, cut them in half in lecture, or not in lecture, in lab for this course, and then you would grow them in like little petri dishes to see what happened you know, over the next you know week or so and monitor their progress, and they would grow back fine. They cut them like any way possible, and they'll, they'll still grow back. It's really cool. Uh, unless they don't have food and proper water, they'll die. But as long as you kept that part fine, you'd be okay. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so they have flat shape, again, for respiration. Very necessary. The gastrovascular cavity uh, has to be that fine branching nature to it. The way every it ensures every cell receives nutrition so they can stay alive. All cells need sustenance to stay alive. Uh, and they do have a central nervous system. So they do have a more concentrated region inside their head. And so this is a little more complex than what we saw in the Nidarians. We're just like a net like thing. It's like, yeah, you know, whatever. Just, you know, we can feel it and that's about it. This thing is like, no, we got we to specialize a little bit. So they have a very prominent head region and then a tail region. Uh, and so they have eye spots to see with, very cute. Uh, they have these protonephridia with what's called flame bulbs. It's called flame bulbs because when they move, they have like the look of a flame to them, like a candle, flickering candle flame. Uh, and so flagellum beat cause that. Uh, but that's used for that sort of process to get rid of waste. Uh, nephrida, the N-E-P-H, is associated with kidneys. So like there's a structure in our kidneys called a nephron that's involved with urine production. So it's, it's kind of an early stage of that process to try and make waste and release it uh, in, the, in the environment and get out of the body. Um, what is that noise? It sounds like somebody's blowing a whistle. I swear, a quarantine has resulted in craziness in my neighbors. Like, good. Oh, you're about to drive me crazy. Uh, and it's only Friday, March 20th. So we're days in here. They, the date when I'm doing this, like, good. Oh, I'm going crazy in the next week's in here. Um... I love being at home, but the people around me are driving me crazy. Not even in my apartment, just neighbors. Anyway, um, so they have those. Uh, then you have the, the, the aqua forms, the water forms. They have like a new type of motion they do to move around. There's like mucus that gets released when they move. Uh, they kind of like constrict up and like pinch themselves apart, which is pretty insane. And that's how they reproduce asexually. They're just kind of like just like rip their bodies in half. It's insane. You can also do it by using, if you wanted to help them, you can just grab like a little scalpel blade and just, just slice them right in half. Uh, and they'll live. Uh, so you can set up a, like your own personal guillotine for <laughs> flatworms in this group and they'll just grow their heads back. Just kind of cool. That should be a movie. Uh, there you go. There's your idea. Uh, and then they can produce sexualized via just fertilization. And so that's actually going to be pretty cool watching video. You'll see a video on that. It's... It's something. Um, and so they have a great ability to regenerate, as I mentioned. So here's showcasing that, that process. So you could just cut off anywhere. They'll just regrow that sucker. And so you can just slice them up. And they'll grow back into something else. And so it definitely feels like something you would see, like, in a villain would have in, like, you know, an X-Men movie or something. And say, oh, man. You know, crazy. Um, so, yeah. So these are fun. Uh, they're, they're pretty immortal. We're just being cut, and so it's pretty cool. Uh, I think they've cut it into as small as one uh, 279th piece of an organism, which that's a small cut. <laughs> just cutting these things back into pieces. It takes them over. Uh, so this video, make sure you watch that. Uh, and then marine flatworms are pretty cool. Uh, look at these vibrant colors. So they're very common in the ocean. You, you might see them. If you're doing some exploring of your own, seeing videos of like ocean stuff, you'll see these things floating around. They kind of like flap and look. They look very elegant, like just like ribbons just floating along inside the ocean. Uh, and there's an awesome video. If you have to watch at least one video for this week, you've got to watch one of these. How these things reproduce. It is insane. One of the coolest things. 
to really lead you in there if you're even watching this. Uh, I have no idea what the numbers will be on this. Uh, I hope at least somebody does and can spread the word. Uh, but the phrase I will lead you with to get you to watch the video, penis fencing. I will, I will ruin no more. That's what you need. Uh, that's the clue to go watch the video because you got to figure out more about that. Uh, so moving on with platyamenthes, we're going to look at the monogenans and trematodes. And so these are parasites, they're commonly called flukes. Uh, so what they do is, oh, excuse me, they'll attach to host, and sometimes they'll get like up in the host. Uh, there's videos I've seen of like them just being infested in like deer liver. And so somebody had this deer liver, uh, and they were cutting it open, and like just pulling out these massive parasitic flukes out of there. It was disturbing. Uh, those poor deer, uh, just they had that in there, but man, it's messed up. Uh, but they have that. And one of the things that comes up, and this is common in parasitic relationships in general, there's a cool course called Parasitology, you may get to take later on. Uh, it's awesome. Parasites are really, really uh, neat. Uh, but they have intermediate and final host. Now you may be wondering, hey, what's the difference between an intermediate and a final host? Well, I got your back. Intermediate host, it's just going to hold it for a short time while it develops, but no reproduction occurs there. Reproduction occurs in the final host. And so that is where the parasite will reach full on maturity and actually reproduce in some way. That's the final. So sometimes we can be accidental intermediate hosts for some parasitics uh, in situations and we can get sick that way. So sometimes we're, you know, accidental host. And then other times we're the final host, other times we're the intermediate host. And so uh, you can have, you're just trying to spread things through you. So a lot of times parasites you're getting like your digestive tract or something, for example, and like then you cause diarrhea, and then you'll cause like a massive expulsion of their their eggs, you know, their offspring, and then it allows well them to spread. So that's what they're trying to do is like use you to spread their stuff. So it's it's fascinating, truly, truly fascinating. Um, and then so trematodes. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Oh, trematodes are um, mammal parasites and also birds. And snails, and so um, that's that's a cool relationship to study is like the life cycles of parasites and how they travel along and how they develop because sometimes they will alter host behavior maybe in some ways. So that's pretty cool as they pass along or they just just basic predatory life cycle like a bird or a snail and then bam it gets the parasite with it and then you know I don't know we we'll eat the bird or a snail or something and then we'll get it or we'll hang out in the same water or something you know we'll just we'll get it that way. Uh, the monogenans are fish parasites. Now you don't think about that, but Man, fish parasites, like those poor fish, like they, they have fins, but you can't pull off a parasite, like you're just gonna be infested with them things. Uh, there's a trematode that causes uh, schistosomiasis, it's a disease, and this is the second most devastating of all human diseases caused by parasites. The only one that causes more is malaria. So um, 200 million people get it, you know, worldwide. This is insane, this is a huge disease. Uh, so stupid trematodes. But now we move on to cess. Tapeworms, ba ba ba. Uh, so tapeworms, they, you'll see pictures of them in lab. They get a view of that beautiful Skolex you see in the top right. Sounds like a Rolex, but it's a Skolex. Uh, nature's version, one that has little sharp hooks in there that allows them to bore into your skin or your internal linings and stay attached there. So you see the species number. Uh, the head region has that hook for attachment, so it looks like a sharp blade because it kind of is. It bores into your tissues and will stay there. They also have suckers to help hold themselves in place as well, so they don't move. Because their idea is to kind of float, sit on our digestive tract, um, and absorb food. And so they feed off what we feed, and so and then they avoid our attack. So our, they avoid our own immune system, which is really cool. Uh, so they can hide the antigens that they show, because that's how the immune system, one of the ways it works, is by looking for antigens, and they respond to foreign versus self antigens. And if it's foreign, they'll try and destroy it, but this can hide it, or it can steal host antigens, so it makes it look like it's good. It can mix up the antigens that it shows, and it can also suppress the immune system. So it's really pretty cool uh, to see how these things can work. Uh, but they themselves have no digestive tract because they get all their food from the host. And we usually get them by eating uh, undercooked meat. And so, especially pork is extremely common. Uh, so that's why it's very important to make sure pork is cooked all the way. But I mean, beef can be the same deal, like, and fish. Like, that's why, you know, it, sushi can be dicey. You know, I know I have friends that eat, like, blue rare steaks uh, and stuff like that all the time. Not me, man. I like my food cooked. Do what you do, right? I don't care. 
Um, I know my mom loves to eat sushi all the time. I, I can't stand sushi either way. Like, I don't like, regardless of the parasites. I just don't like the way it tastes. I think it's gross. The only sushi I've mildly ever been interested in was uh, fried sushi because, I mean, of course, you know, uh, being from the South, of course, I like fried food. Uh, it was okay. It hides the taste mostly. Uh, yeah, I'm just not a big fan of that. And pork either, really. I like barbecue. So I guess I like that kind of pork, but that's usually pretty cooked. Okay. Uh, but yeah, beef, though. I, I cook my stuff. Uh, <laughs> there's actually. So dealing with parasites, right? So, and like salmonella and such. So this is a random story. So back uh, when I was uh, first living my own, my own, like fully, uh, in grad school, so uh, I was living alone in my apartment, and I was trying to cook more, and so uh, I cooked uh, chicken, and so uh, I would get like frozen chicken breasts and try and cook them, and like my own barbecue uh, pieces or whatever, you know, try and class it up a bit, but the only way I knew how to cook chicken at the time like that was by boiling it, and then I could never tell if it was done or not. So I would just cook it for hours on end, and then eventually people would realize, like, I was just like, okay, it has to be done now. It's been cooking, and it's been boiling for six hours. It must be done. And so then I'd still be paranoid and wouldn't eat half of it. Uh, but all to avoid parasites. So, yeah. And make sure you also prepare your food in good areas. So even if the meat is cooked fine, or if the meat itself is fine, if the area is contaminated, that's where you have to be uh, cautious of. So hygiene, also very important. I worked at a Chick-fil-A once, and we always had to just keep chicken dishes separate for that sort of thing. It wasn't like parasites, but just, you know, bacteria and such, but still. Good hygiene. Wash your countertops and kitchen countertops, especially in this time of quarantine. We're spending more time cooking indoors. Keep it clean, folks. Uh, anyway, here's a tapeworm. And so you can see they have uh, they have these little tags, those little segments. Each one of those are reproductive structures, and they just release those suckers off. Um, and then they've been used historically as a way to get rid of fat because they'll sit there and you can eat what you want, and they'll take in a bunch of it. That's not really a good system to go with because they usually just make you malnourished, and then your body's not getting the nutrition you need, and you're kind of just it's it's not good. Don't do it. Uh, it was an episode of the Up. Office too, where like uh, character Kelly did it, and that's not healthy. Don't don't do that. Uh, this one thing we found a cat. This one found a whale. That's in a jar. That's a big jar. That's a big tapeworm. People uh, terrifying. Uh, I saw a news story uh, more recently about apparently somebody, some mom gave it to her daughter for beauty pageants or something. Uh, so it's pretty insane. Don't do that. That's bad. Uh, don't ingest yourself with a tapeworm or the parasite. Like that's not good. Uh, here's a story that talks about um, a, a tapeworm being pulled out of a patient's mouth, and so you can see this thing was over six feet long. Like, oh my goodness! Like even sedated. Like that's insane. And they got it from eating raw or cooked pork. So you don't always typically know you even have it either, which is terrifying. Uh, in this case, if you lose a lot of weight quickly, that's usually always like, oh, go see a doctor, because, I mean, something might be going on. In this case, a 20-foot-long tapeworm. Uh, my God, that's a thing of nightmares. Like, that's the thing that really freaks you out. It makes you not want to eat anything. Um, like, God, it's gracious, a 20-foot tapeworm just kill me now. Um, man, that's terrifying. Um, so, watch. Uh, a couple years ago, and you see the article date, 10 years ago, over 10 years ago now, uh, there was a thing going on about, like, tapeworm diet, uh, and, like, people would talk about that, and, like, no, don't, don't do that, that's bad, and so it can cause weight loss, but also other issues and leading to possibly death, right, so don't do that, and it can get big itself up to 35 feet, do you want a 35 foot tapeworm living inside of you? I don't think so, I know I don't, I sure as hell don't want anything that size living inside of me, uh, so... That is insane. So yeah, don't do that. Uh, and so here's one that is pretty common found in port and also invade your brain. So not only does it take your nutrition, give you diarrhea, and make you sick, it can also invest inside your brain. Here we can see cysts inside of your brain. Let me tell you something, folks. That brain, if there's cysts being formed, that means you're losing matter inside your brain, which is needed for your brain to function. So this can cause a wide variety of problems. And the nervous system, and so cause issues all over the place. So that's what those white lumps are inside the brain. That ain't normal. You don't want that happening. And here's an uh, article I found recently from last year, where actually a patient had ingested one of these, 18 years old, 
right? Took in a parasitic tapeworm, you know, just eating some stuff and some meat, got into his system, bam, they got in his brain, he had problems, uh, it got all over his brain, he was having issues, and even his testes too, so in his eye, everywhere, all this stuff from these eggs that he'd eaten, they were going to the full-on tapeworms, and they, they really couldn't treat him because it was in his brain so bad, and then he eventually died two weeks after being admitted. So uh, these tapeworms are no joke, so do not ingest in a tapeworm like that. That is not uh, and then here's some other pictures where it shows the actual holes they can cause inside the brain. This is not good. You don't want that to happen. Uh, another way you can get it is from eating uh, other types of meat, uh, especially, you know, uh, in China, they eat uh, frog meat and they use it to calm different wounds and things, and that just causes infection. Perhaps we should not participate in such actions and activities anymore, or eat pangolins, or try to avoid bats as well to try to prevent things from spreading. Uh, known risk factors with no real benefit of doing it. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of a terrifying lecture today. Think about it. A lot of tapeworm stuff. Like you think like, oh, the predators are the scariest part. No, it's the parasites, I think, that are the most terrifying. Uh, but yeah, hope you enjoyed this journey in the One more this week. Mollusk. Peace.